Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Beth Berman. I'm the CEO of a venture philanthropy called the American Journalism Project, which is dedicated to rebuilding local news. In this session, I'm going to share how we at the American Journalism Project are helping local news organizations across the country explore the applications of generative AI in their work. First, just to set the stage a bit, I'll tell you a little bit about the American Journalism Project and what we do. We're a venture philanthropy focused on catalyzing the growth of the nonprofit local news sector. This means we rally philanthropic dollars, and then we use those dollars to build and grow nonprofit news organizations with a laser focus on building sustainable news organizations that can endure. Over the last two decades, largely brought on by the rise of the internet. Local newspapers have been in really a slow motion decline. Newspaper advertising revenue has dropped by 82%. 2,500 newspapers have outright shuttered. And on average, we are losing two American newspapers a week. Since 2000, there has been a 57% decline in the number of American journalists and editors serving in communities. What this means is that many of the remaining publications that still exist are what we call ghost newspapers. They're offering mostly national news with very little original reporting about what's happening in their local communities. In fact, there was one study that came out last year that showed that only 17% of the stories in local newspapers are actually local. And the implications of this are well documented and they're dire. This is not abstract. Political scientists have now measured the degree to which the hollowing out of daily newspapers in America have had profound consequences on our democracy. It's leading to the decline in civic engagements. Americans have become less knowledgeable about their local governments. They're less interested in the actions their local officials are taking, and they're less likely to participate on election day. Timothy Snyder, many of you may be familiar with his work. He's a Yale historian and the author of On Tyranny, calls the local news crisis the essential problem of our republic. We see our role at the American Journalism Project as ushering in a new model for how we finance local news in our country as nonprofit organizations that we sustain in similar ways that we do other civic institutions that help stitch our communities together. We make growth investments in existing organizations and we incubate new news organizations. To date, we've committed over $42 million to 41 grantee newsrooms from Mississippi to Montana, from Puerto Rico to West Virginia, and that number is growing. In addition to these direct investments, we've helped mobilize close to $60 million in local philanthropy to launch market-specific initiatives as part of a program we've developed with civic leaders, place-based funders, and news organizations to understand the information gaps in a community and to figure out the right solutions to fill those gaps. As many people will touch on throughout this conference, the rise of generative AI is giving way to a moment of profound change in how society engages with news and information. AI will have significant implications on our society and the journalism industry is no exception. And so with this in mind, in July, the American Journalism Project announced a new partnership with OpenAI to help local news organizations explore and understand the use of AI in their newsrooms. The opportunities that AI presents are promising. It could allow journalism organizations to engage in deeper and richer analysis of data and information, strengthen the user and reader experience, and equip journalists and readers with powerful tools to process information and data. At the same time, there are many important concerns that AI developers and journalists and society need to contend with, including the spread of misinformation, increased distrust, concerns over bias and privacy issues and copyright. 
We think it's really critical that local news organizations are engaging with these tools and thinking smartly about how to deploy them and when not to deploy them. By the same token, generative AI and its algorithms are really only as strong as the news and information they are drawing from. Robust reporting and people-led fact-finding efforts at the local level are among the most important for sourcing reliable information. AI's success and its reliability is necessarily dependent on a strong local news infrastructure. With that in mind, we're doing two things as it relates to AI. First, we're creating a product studio to explore the application of AI in local news organizations. We'll give local news organizations we work with coaching and help them explore how to leverage AI tools for their work. And we'll make sure that all the local news organizations we work with have access to the learnings that come out of this work by documenting and sharing best practices, lessons that surface from the experiments as they unfold. Second, we're going to be making grants to organizations in our portfolio so newsrooms can test AI application. And from that, we hope to share examples of what it looks like, what the work looks like, what's working, and make sure that the journalism field at large is aware of the smart applications of these tools. In addition, OpenAI has offered us free access to API credits, up to $5 million of them. And that is something that our news organizations will have access to should they choose to use it. We are really at the beginning of this work. A lot of ideas are beginning to surface. Things like creating personalized communications to reach new donors, members, and corporate sponsors. Using AI to help code to improve websites and products. Leveraging AI to brainstorm headlines or to brainstorm social media copy. Analyzing data, both for reporting and to understand audience data. Automating coverage of public meetings assisting with copy editing, helping to scale community engagement and one-on-one -on -one direct interaction with community members. These are the kinds of ideas that are surfacing and over the coming months, we will learn a lot about how to best use, to, how to best use these tools. So thank you so much for having me. We are going to learn a lot over the coming months and we will look forward to sharing that as we do. Hi everyone, it is so great to be with you to talk about this really remarkable uh, voice recognition AI technology that Illinois Holocaust Museum has rolled out uh, in the past eight years. Uh, we began to really think about as we move further away from the history of the Holocaust and face a collapsing window of time where we were losing our survivors, we knew that we had to think about ways to continue to preserve and share their stories for generations to come. And so we partnered with USC Shoah Foundation, who had developed a new technology called Dimensions and Testimony, where they were using custom voice recognition technology to record survivor testimonies, but to be able to ask them questions so that you could, in real time, uh, through this uh, voice technology, have a conversation and ask survivors questions. Uh, so we sent seven of our survivors to participate uh, and recording their testimonies and being asked questions. Uh, and ultimately, in the end, what we were given were uh, seven survivors who could answer upwards to 20 to 25,000 questions about their experiences during, uh, before, and even after the Holocaust, as well as just questions about their life uh, in general. Uh, everything from um, what their favorite sport might be, to their favorite color, their favorite food, to perhaps more serious topics about whether or not um, the Holocaust made them question their faith or uh, what uh, lessons do they have for us today? What do they think about uh, ongoing hate and genocide in the world? Uh, and I have to say eight years in uh, to this project, uh, I'm still amazed uh, when I observe visitors asking questions of these survivors. And I think to myself, oh, I don't know if they're gonna have an answer uh, to that, and and they do, uh, because these aren't answers that are being pulled, you know, randomly down from the internet. Um, these are actually answers uh, that uh, are being pulled essentially from the cloud that the survivors uh, answered. So it's pretty remarkable. Um, we now have an experience at the museum called the Survivor Stories Theater, where our visitors uh, come in to a 60-plus person theater 
uh, watch an eight to nine minute video that gives an introduction or context to the survivor's story. And then through a volunteer facilitator who um, asks the survivors the questions, um, they uh, have an experience. And what we've uh, noticed, and I'm gonna show you kind of a little sample of that in a moment, uh, is that our visitors aren't saying to the volunteer, could you ask Aaron or Sam what life was like before the Holocaust? They're looking at Aaron and Aaron or Sam on the screen and saying, Sam, what was it like, you know, growing up uh, in Poland before the war? Aaron, what was it like to be uh, in hiding, right, for two years? Uh, so they're talking to uh, the survivor on the screen. And what it's created is a really personal and intimate experience where we know that we can never replace uh, a survivor who's sitting uh, in front of you uh, in real life. Uh, but that experience sometimes can be really intimidating, make uh, people nervous, uh, and we're not seeing that with the with their technology. There's a kind of a real comfort in being able to ask the questions that you're most interested uh, in learning about, uh, and it's also creating a really profound historical empathy uh, in uh, learning more about this human being sitting in front of you, that it's not just about uh, a survivor of the Holocaust, but you're learning also, too, about their life before and after. Uh, that kind of a uh, human experience of the resiliency and strength that it took uh, to rebuild in the aftermath of this genocide. I think what's also too important to point out is that USC Shoah Foundation really believed in this concept of ethical editing. So you're not editing out mannerisms and characteristics of, of survivors. So we have a, a survivor, Aaron, um, who talks a lot with his hand, uh, and that's not edited out. Uh, we have uh, survivors oftentimes when you ask them questions that will take, you know, either short or even sometimes long uh, pauses. One of the survivors, Pink is Gooder, when you ask him, do you have any regrets? There's a full minute pause while he is kind of emotionally gathering himself in order to answer that, that question that's really difficult for him. Those aren't edited out as you wouldn't do uh, if a real survivor was sitting in front of you and tell them that they, you know, kind of need to move on or, or speed it up. Uh, so that that's really important to kind of preserve that experience. But what I want to do now is just show you two brief clips um, from the experience, the point of view of Fritzi and Aaron, um, and you can see uh, how how this interaction plays out. So I'll play the first clip. It's going to be a little bit of a pause, uh, and we'll end uh, with Aaron. What this has done, it stirred up a lot of the memories that I didn't want to think about anymore that I thought were hidden. Before we were taken into the ghetto, it was during the last days of Passover. In the middle of that night, there was the knock that came on our door. My mother opened the door, and there were soldiers standing there with a gun pointing at her. We lived in this ghetto until one day they came to take us to the train stations. I have so much more to tell you, so please ask me questions. So does anyone have a question for Fritzi? Yes. What was the hardest part of your experience in the concentration camp? I thought I would die when I was walking towards the gas chambers. I thought I would die when I didn't have enough food. I feel humbled by the experience. I feel this is some, this is probably the best thing that I can do for the future for both myself, the museum, and the audience. This is our memory. This is what, uh, what we've gone through and spoken about for to thousands and thousands of young people about our losing our families living in conditions which are unbearable, especially as a 10-year-old because you wanted to live so desperately. All this comes out in this hologram. 
And uh, I think it will serve a great purpose for the future. Because I was always concerned that once we die, the Holocaust will be a paragraph in history. They kill Jews. That's it. This will prevent it. So I hope you found uh, meaning in the words of, of Fritzi and Aaron. I have to tell you, uh, we lost Fritzi about uh, two years ago and Aaron about four. So uh, it's, of course, uh, personally and professionally, uh, you know, wonderful to continue uh, to have their stories to share. But I think it continues to uh, show uh, the strength uh, and importance of uh, this great technology uh, that we're able uh, to give to our visitors uh, at the museum. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Lee. I'm the CEO of the Skill Up Coalition. And on behalf of both myself and my colleague, Matt G, who you'll hear from in a moment, uh, we just wanted to thank you. Thank you to the Center for Democracy and Technology for the privilege of allowing us to share a few thoughts on Gen AI and what it has meant for our respective organizations. Um, so Skill Up is a technology platform. Uh, we help connect vulnerable adults and young adults to high quality jobs and education providers. And, uh, and what I think is important to understand is how Skill Up users, of which we've had several million come to our site uh, since we launched a few years ago, how they come to our platform. What's their reality? Um, so I think there are three realities. One, they come with lots of self-doubt. Uh, they've been burned by the past to experiences that honestly have not been good. Second, they're uncertain of the skills that they're going to need in order to thrive in the current marketplace. And then third, really importantly, they lack social capital connections. Uh, this notion that sometimes it's who you know, not what you know, that can be most important. And so for skill up, Gen AI, if used correctly, and we'll talk about that in a bit, can really, really be a game changer. It helps to create bespoke experiences that make it all about you, that are tailored to you. And that word you, uh, we think is operative on how we think about Gen AI. So one, it helps job seekers doubt their own self-doubt, right? Because we, using Gen AI, can surface up opportunities that are bespoke to them. We can curate opportunities for careers and jobs and educational opportunities that meet you where you are. We can help you understand what skills you have and maybe more importantly, what you don't have, right? We can offer up skills fillers to help, skill, uh, help fill skill gaps that pertain to you as an individual. And then lastly, we can help through using social capital or coaching to help flip the script. So it really is about what you know and not who you know that matters. And we can help connect job seekers to connection points that'll be helpful to you. That said, there are always two sides to a story. And so as we regale the benefits of what Gen AI can do for us, I think it's crucial, and I think we're all thinking about this, right? That we comprehend the potential and negative consequences that this can, um, uh, that this can bear. And I think it's come upon all of us to heed the warning cry around bias and ethics so that we ensure job seekers aren't led down a slippery slope of unintended consequences. So on this note, and so many other issues around data and ethics, let me introduce you to my friend and data uh, expert, uh, Matt Gee. Thanks, Steve. I'm Matt Gee, co-founder and chief data nerd at BrightHive. And I'd like to start just by saying that I am so inspired by partners like SkillUp who are finding incredibly creative and impactful ways to use Gen AI for good. Along with SkillUp, we are seeing hundreds of exciting applications of generative AI in education, in workforce training, in economic mobility, and beyond. I was at a hackathon a few weeks ago here in Chicago, where I live, uh, where a group of high school students in just a few hours built their own AI college advisor using data from the, the Department of Education's college scorecard and some open source code. Just the, the sheer explosion of creativity from this first wave of generative AI experiments is so inspiring. And we're learning so much from each other as community members. One of the most important things that we're learning 
from these early experiments is that generative AI isn't a magic wand that you could just wave at a challenge and have it magically solved. Rather, it's a new, remarkably capable tool that has a lot of promising uses, some clear limitations, and very real potential for harm. The good news is, because it's early days, there's still a lot that you and I can do to tilt the balance toward benefit. So here are some challenges that I think with a little attention and resourcing, we can make a difference in together. The first challenge is the challenge of access. These powerful Gen AI tools still require the basics of digital access, a device, a connection to the internet, basic digital literacy. We must continue to invest in bridging the digital divide to ensure universal access to AI tools. Second is the challenge of use. Working with a chatbot is a new class of skills. These skills need to be included in curriculum alongside essential 21st century skills like communication and teamwork in order to prevent a growing AI skills gap. Third is the challenge of bias. Bias can creep into generative AI solutions in a lot of ways, from the underlying data that they're trained on to the code and prompts that go into making a chatbot work. It's already been shown that large language models trained on the internet can have deep implicit biases like doctors all being male and nurses being female. How might a deep bias like that affect a career recommendation AI giving high school students uh, different advice for young men versus young women? It takes constant vigilance to identify and correct for these biases. Lastly is the challenge of control and governance. Who decides what data AI gets access to or what guardrails should be set around its capabilities? Individuals need greater control over how AI uses their data. Communities need governance mechanisms for raising concerns and setting limits. Ultimately, government needs to set good policy to prevent some of the most serious AI risks and disparate impacts from happening. There's a lot of work to be done. It's going to take all of us. There won't be a person on this planet whose life isn't affected by AI. That means we all need a seat at the table and, and real power to shape the future we're racing toward. If we remain AI curious, if we recognize our power by showing up, and perhaps most importantly, if we're willing to share our failures as a community, we will learn faster, make fewer collective mistakes, and ultimately, we'll be able to build bots that will, among other things, help millions more skill up users find good jobs. And that sounds like a job worth doing. Thank you. Hello. Uh, let me start with a thank you to the Center for Democracy and Technology and the Stand Together Trust for organizing this conference. As the development and, and use of AI sweeps our collective discourse, it's essential to have spaces like this, spaces to interrogate the risks and the potential harms of using machine learning and artificial intelligence, but also spaces to explore the potential benefits of using these tools, the potential benefits of machine, le machine learning for human rights and for supporting human rights defenders around the world. Uh, my name is Dana Ingleton, and I am the executive director of an organization called Curadox, which stands for Human Rights Information and Documentation Systems. We are an organization, a nonprofit organization that has been working for 40 years to support human rights defenders around the world to collect and systematize and make good use of the information they're collecting about human rights violations to ensure it's effectively used for justice and accountability measures. To do this, we develop strategies for collecting and documenting information, but we also develop our own software, a database called Uwazi, that makes the collection of evidence, laws, and research more accessible to those who are using it to promote and protect human rights. And in recent years, we've been really interested in exploring integrating machine learning into our Uwazi tool as a way to support civil society to sort through and parse increasingly an ever bigger 
um, data collections at unprecedented speeds. A good example is our partnership with uh, UPR Info. UPR Info is an NGO that supports the realization of human rights through the uh, Universal Periodic Review process at the UN. With them, we have integrated machine learning into the UWASI database to label and to track the progress of thousands of recommendations um, of voluntary pledges made by UN member states about meeting their obligations. Now, that might not sound like much, but let's talk about the impact. In the past, um, documenting everything that has come out of the Universal Periodic, Re Periodic Review cycle, including gathering all the documents, uh, labeling all of the documents, like, you know, putting them all in the database, etc. This process could take up to three months after a cycle. With the use of machine learning in the UWASI software, this process now takes only five days. So you can imagine that the impact of integrating machine learning um, can have it can be huge on those collecting information, understanding huge sets of data for making sure that governments are held to account for their human rights obligations. Another example is the collection of content. All over the world, civil society is collecting and producing and sharing more and more content, whether that's videos or photos or other kinds of data that document human rights violations. In fact, there's ever increasing amounts, more than ever before in human history. A, a good example is in the conflict in Syria. Our partners at the Syrian Archive Project have preserved an estimated 40 years, 40 years of open source video demonstrating and documenting crimes and atrocities. Think about that. That means that if we were to press play on that database right now, we would be watching nonstop until 2063. So as you can imagine, integrating machine learning as a tool that we use for faster and effective labeling and archiving and pattern recognition um, of, the, of the documents that, that civil society are collecting, doing this and adding it to civil society's toolbox, it will be an essential element in ensuring civil society is equipped to go forward into a future where there is certainly not going to be a lack of data, but the whole problem will be making sense of all of that data. Lastly, I would like to also note the importance of making sure that civil society, including, you know, Herodox and all of our partners and everybody else at this conference and people around the world, including them in the debate about accountability and the responsible development of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So while at Herodox, we are you know, happily and very excitedly exploring the use of machine learning, we also want to be part of the conversation about how to do that responsibly, how to make sure that in collecting and parsing and managing all this data, we're not contributing to any issues related to data security or privacy or anything else. And I really look forward to hearing the other talks in this conference, to continuing the conversation in other spaces to make sure that we as a collective civil society are ensuring the responsible development and deployment of these tools. And with that, I would like to say thank you. If anybody would like to speak further about our work uh, using machine learning, our work thinking about the responsible development of it, then please do feel free to reach out. Thank you and have a great day. Hi everyone at the Center for Democracy and Technology Conference, Sal Khan here from Khan Academy. So many of y'all are probably familiar with Khan Academy. We are a not-for-profit organization with a mission of providing a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. So we're big believers and one of our big theories of change is, hey, if we can scale this idea, and right now we have over 150 million registered users, half are in classrooms, half are outside of classrooms, half are domestic, half are international. But if we can allow people the opportunity and incentive to fill in their gaps, give them access to coursework that they might not otherwise have access to, in a lot of the same ways that if you're, if you're a middle or upper middle class family, you would get tutor for your, for your child to address those gaps. Um, or you, you might even be a position to, to tutor them yourself. That's all the lay of the land before we got to last year. OpenAI reaches out to us, shows us GPT-4. This is nine six to nine months before the world saw it three months before uh, chat gpt came into existence and chat gpt just as a reminder is not even gpt4 the one that most people are familiar with the one that came out in november of 2022 that was gpt 3.5 i was initially skeptical because i had seen gpt 3.5 gpt 3.2 
I didn't think it was immediately relevant, but GPT-4, we it has imperfections, but we realize if we take the proper safeguards and put guardrails around it, that this actually has the potential to take us even further on this journey of scaling tutors uh, for students. And not just tutors for students, but tutors or teaching assistants for teachers. So that's what we immediately started working on. We released Conmigo in March of 2023 at the same time as the GPT-4 launch. And that's exactly what Conmigo's charter is do, is to become a tutor for every student and a teaching assistant for every teacher. And we immediately were very excited about the power, but we had to add some extra layers of both guardrails and some capabilities to, to address some of the rough spots of generative AI. We put all, we have a lot of work in. You'll find that Conmigo is much better at things like math, especially math tutoring, than say just raw GPT-4 out of the box, which is by the way, the most cutting edge model that is, that is out there. Uh, and also you'll see that Conmigo is anchored on Khan Academy content, which reduces the error problem, the, the, the incorrect information, what's often known as the hallucination problem. Now above and beyond that, there's obviously fears around what if students get into unconstructive conversations or try to cheat. So Conmigo does not cheat. It's all about a Socratic dialogue. Uh, and we can give you more examples of that. You know, when you ask Conmigo, why, why should I care about this? It says, well, what do you care about? Or if, if I ask Conmigo, uh, you know, how does this work? It says, well, tell me what you know about it so far. And then it, it will ask leading questions and then fill in blanks as necessary, which, which is very, uh, uh, we think, very good pedagogy. But above and beyond that, especially for under 18 students, every interaction that students have with the AI is transparent to parents and teachers. We have a second artificial intelligence that monitors the conversations. And if it deems that any of them are going into shady or unproductive directions, it actively notifies uh, the parents and teachers to make sure that we have optimum safety and optimum transparency. And so where we see this going, already people can go on Conmigo if they're having uh, needing help with an exercise, say, on Khan Academy. It won't give them the answer. It will Socratically help nudge them in the right direction. It can go further than that. It can emulate historical characters. It can engage in debates with students. It can act as an academic or career coach. It can help them with essays, where once again, it's not gonna write the essay for the student, but it can give them feedback much as an ethical uh, writing coach would. And on that point, we actually think this is the way to address the cheating issue that ChatGPT has introduced. If, if all that educators index on is the output, the essay itself, then yes, yeah, students are going to be able to go to chat GPT or wherever and generate an essay. It's going to be very hard to detect. But if students instead are assigned to do their essays with Conmigo, then Conmigo will be part of the process. They can riff together, they can brainstorm, and then Conmigo can report to the teacher not just the final output, but actually how the student got there. It can tell the teacher things like, hey, we worked for about four hours, um, we, we, had, we went back and forth on what a good thesis statement was. I pushed the student a bit on making sure that a certain reference they got was a legitimate one. And not only can it do that, but it can also be a real teaching assistant for the teacher beyond that. Helping teachers create lesson plans, helping teachers create rubrics, as I just mentioned, giving a first pass on grading. And this is just, I think, the, the, the very top of the first inning uh, of what we're doing. And what we're trying to do is Lean into it, but do it in the most responsible and thoughtful way. For example, above and beyond the safeguards I just said, no personally identifiable information goes between Conmigo and the underlying model. None of the student's information is being used to train the underlying model because we want to make sure that we can show that we can have very positive use cases from generative AI that don't um, hit into those gray areas that a lot of folks are appropriately concerned about. And in the coming months and years, you're going to see more and more power here, both on the teacher and the student and actually the parent side to keep them all in the loop and to maximize the amount of learning that happens. We're actually starting our first wave of real efficacy studies. Uh, we already have good indication it's definitely not doing harm and it's definitely increasing engagement, but we wanna show that how it can actually impact real, uh, real student learning. You're going to see even more, hopefully, richness of the tutoring experience where the AI is able to remember, say, a student's interest. But we can make or um, remember what they covered last week, but at the same time, make that information transparent and 
um, essentially modifiable by the teachers and students. So if the AI builds an inference on the student, they can see the inferences and they could say, no, you can reset that. I don't, I'm not into soccer anymore. Or actually, I've mastered that concept off platform. The real power happens when you have the generative AI tutor with all of these safeguards we've talked about, but it's connected to all of the stakeholders, especially for under 18 students, the students, the parents, and the teachers.